Today is Saturday, February 25th, 2006, and we are interviewing Roger Allen Kelsey at the Brantford Library in Brantford, Connecticut. I'm Catherine Stock. I'm a professor of history at Connecticut College, and we are conducting this interview as a part of Matthew Shell's Eagle Scout project for the Connecticut Yankee Council Troop 428. Major Kelsey, could you state for the record what war and branch of the service that you served in? Uh, it was WW2, and I served in the Army. Okay, and what was your rank? Well, I, got, I went in as a private and came out as a major. And where did you serve? That's a good question. Um, first, uh, there is no combat duty in in what I have to say. Um, I went through training in Fort Bragg, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, North Carolina, and I did engineering work and so forth from the Philadelphia office <coughs> for the Corps of Engineers. I um, went through basic training <coughs> in Fort Bragg, and then I was taken taken down to, to uh, Camp Landing, Florida, where I got further <laughs> drunk train training <laughs> and went through several months of, of, uh, of uh, maneuvers. Eventually, I was on a ship working out of, out of uh, Philadelphia, after which we left and went out to Okinawa. Um, you know, I read that one of the really unique things um, about um, the American military in World War II, and this was different from any of the other countries' military units, was that there were two support people like yourself, engineers and all kinds of other support people for every combat troop. Um, and that that was unique really in the history of warfare to have that kind of support for the combat troops and it was one of the reasons that the Allies were victorious. And I never realized that before. So it's one of the reasons your story is so important to us to be able to remember. Um, I didn't realize that until now. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Yeah. Two support people for every combat troop. Mm -hmm. And, and a, a total of 12 million people. 12 million Americans that mm -hmm. were involved in that war effort. Um, so let's just start at the, the beginning. What you were doing um, before, I noticed in your um, bio information that you were drafted yes. um, in early 1941. So let's start with what you were doing before you were drafted um, and, um, uh, and then uh, you know, why you chose the branch of service that you did and how you got involved um, in the very beginning. Oh. How you felt about it too. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I had a year and a half of, of uh, West Polytechnic Institute for Mechanical Engineering. Um, for whatever reason, I didn't stay. And then I got a job working for the New York Navy and the Hartford Railroad mm -hmm. as a drawbridge mechanic. And I was there for um, three years, I guess. And then, draft came along, and this was draft prior to combat, um, where we were going to go in for a year of training, which frankly nobody believed at that time, but anyway, that's right. the way it was. Because you knew the war was coming. Yeah, but we had a pretty darn good idea. No kidding. And 
and their start me off again. <laughs> oh, so so when so when did you hear? Did you? I mean, how does it happen that one is drafted? You get a notice you in the to, mail. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you have to you'll have to register. Right. And then they have a lottery. Right. Oh, okay. That's how it works then too. Yep. Yeah. And then. <laughs> then you're gone. Yeah, right. Right, how long did they give you from the time of your draft notice to till you had to report? Oh, maybe a month, and that's a guess. And were you married or single at that time? I was single at that point. Oh, okay. And, and you were 34 years old? 24. 24 years old, that's good as my math. 24 years old at the time that you were uh, that you were drafted. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and um, why did you choose your branch of service? I didn't have any choice. Oh, I got drafted. It was chosen for you. I see. Okay, but you had this engineering training, which in the end uh, served you well. Lots of things served me well. Tell really. me. Tell me. Well, <clears throat> I worked. I had my own shop where I did green engine work. Uh -huh. um, I worked in heavy equipment on the river. Oh, wow, all before you um, yep. were drafted. Uh -huh. And uh, <clears throat> I also was involved with dyslexia. So I came out of school figuring that maybe I wasn't too bright. Mm -hmm. Oh, but you had lots of skills. Well. That could be. So having um, some background in engineering at um, Worcester Polytechnic uh, probably helped you have some skills that were useful for the for when, when you were drafted. I would think. I would. I would think so. Not so much when I was drafted, but as my army life progressed, mm -hmm. I got more into it. Especially when I got into corps of engineers. Okay. Although the artists department gave me some too. Good. Um, so um, tell me about what you remember about Pearl Harbor. Where were you when you first heard about Pearl Harbor and, and, um, and how did you and the, the men that you were in the service with at that time uh, feel about that? <laughs> it came as no surprise. Oh, you weren't surprised? Pardon? You were not surprised? No. Why not? Well, I think the method that at Pearl Harbor itself was a surprise. But I don't think the fact that we were now involved was a surprise. Right. Uh, and I, I happened to be on maneuvers at the time, and we heard it over the radio. Um, and, and you. Nobody you, certainly was expecting to go home at the end of our year. Right. That's what you said. That yeah. that no one thought um, that you'd get your training and there wouldn't be a war. That you, in one way or another, that the war was coming. Yeah. Um, but but um, it was surprising that it happened uh, at Pearl Harbor, or were you surprised that the Japanese were able to so successfully um, attack any of our installations? <laughs> That's hard to answer. Did you think they had that capability to be able to have a to, to um, no. have a surprise attack like no, that? No, no, that part was certainly unexpected. Right. I thought. I didn't even think that maybe this was going to start for us because of the Japanese, but I figured we were going to get into it. Right. And, it, and yes, it was a, a surprise for the method that they used. Right. Um, and, um, and then, but as soon as it happened, you knew we'd be involved in the war against Germany as well. Yeah. Did you know where, um, uh, in which theater you would end up um, serving after your training was done? I have no idea. You just did what you were told. Not at all, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Tell me more about your your work assignments with the current Army Corps of um, Engineers. And uh, when you talk about going on maneuvers, um, tell me more about what that meant and the kinds of things that you did. <laughs> it meant miserable living in up tents in the heat of Louisiana summer. <laughs> Oof. Riding in long strings of trucks. Mm -hmm. Well, you finally had to wear a gas mask in order to keep the dust out of your throat and not the eyes and everything else. Really? Yeah, you would stand up in the back end of the 6x6 six six truck. Maybe you were 
ten trucks back, and you, know, you can imagine what that what going over red dusty roads was. Mm. Wasn't bad in front. Of course, today we think of Louisiana with hurricanes, not with being dry. But it could be. But we know it must have been terribly hot. <laughs> very damn. Oh. And and again, because I'm not very mechanically minded, help me understand. What were you practicing? Repair work or coordination of of materials? What were you doing when you were on maneuvers? Well, at that at that point, I was in the field artillery. Oh, okay. And uh, we were just planning uh, combat. Actually. Oh, okay. Um, that was before you had the training for the U.S. Corps of Engineers. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I started. <coughs> I started out in the field artillery. I got my commission in the ordnance department. Mm -hmm. I had. Uh, I <coughs> I got my first promotion in the ordnance department. I got the second promotion in the ordnance department, and then when I was training this this company that I then commanded. I came in from the field, as I wrote, and uh, I was now out of the artist department. I was in the field, I was in the uh, engineer corps. Um, I have read about Camp Shelby in Mississippi a little bit, mm -hmm. um, that it had the capacity to handle like 76,000 men at, while they were being trained. I can't, I can't, uh, Tell you numbers, I don't know. Numbers, it was a bit, it was it a big was, operation. It was a pretty damn good sized city. Right, and Tennessee. with people, with men from all over the United States, oh, yeah. not just from the South, right? That, oh, no. People came from all over and where they were housed and trained together, mm -hmm. right? How was intense? Intense. Mm -hmm. um, what, um, do you remember anything special about the, the about the, your your first training experience and the people that you met from other parts of the country, or anything about the other men, or the testing that you had, or the things that you had to learn. No, not or the particular. food. Pardon? <laughs> or the food you had to eat. Oh, uh, the food was not bad. In fact, uh, I, I must say really that it was quite good, mm -hmm. and it was plentiful. Mm -hmm. As long as you're in camp, right, and not not so much when you were outside of camp. No, you know, they, you know the, <laughs> the kitchen went in the back end of the truck. Oh, right. And uh, you certainly didn't go hungry. What's a K ration or a C ration? I read about those as well, and they also had a lot of calories in them. But but um, but they probably weren't as good as eating at camp either. I can't imagine. Oh no no no, they, they weren't. Um, Got me now. Yeah. I'd forgotten. Um, there, were they like dr like dried food packs or like? Oh, I remember what I read is that they always had a cigarette in them and a candy bar. They had a candy, yes. That's yeah, right. two yeah. cigarettes and a candy bar. Yeah. And whatever else that, they could that provide. One, that was. Uh, I can't tell you whether it was a K ration or a C yeah. ration. Now the other the C rations they will call them that okay. came in a can, and there was things like ham and eggs and. Such stuff, and they were not bad. Really? In fact, I discovered there's a bit fine hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, chicken. You had whatever they whatever they could put in the can. Yeah, absolutely, and they were good. Well, I the other thing that I read was that usually um, the the average trainee put on um, six pounds or something in training because they they got so much stronger and they had good food. And coming out of the Great Depression, not everybody had had good. No, food. that's absolutely right. Yeah. Did you say you were an officer in charge of the mess hall also? I all? I did after I, after I got a commission. Yeah. Now, what did that involve? What did you have to do on that job? Not an awful lot, really, except to supervise and make sure it was clean and things were being done right. So clean, cl clean, sanitary condition was important. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And and, and and the food had to be prepared decently and properly, mm -hmm. and uh, 
most of the mesh sergeants that I had were more than capable. Some of them actually came from pretty good residents back home. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. That's not, that's not what one normally thinks about that about about mess surgeons, but that would be great. Yeah. And they had uh, and they had good quality food to work. Very with. good. Um. Okay, so. Um, well, you guys all were eating. Well, that's right. Rabbits, whatever else you could get. Yeah, that's right. That the um, people at home were doing rationing. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, so that there would be enough food for the the soldiers. Yep, that's right. That's right. Um, I don't know who said the army marches on its stomach. My guess as well. <laughs> you don't go too far without it. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. I don't. Th I have no idea. Some general is quoted as saying the army. Oh yeah, on it's, its just. It's just. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a standard saying. That's right. That's right. So mostly um, by those who weren't there. When you said you you shipped out to, um, eventually you were in Okinawa or support on a ship out, outside of Okinawa um, in support services. Yeah. Um, tell me the kinds of things that you did then. Well, this was a this was a salvage ship that I was on. Okay. And. We, we got that, well, I was somewhere around the Central Pacific at the time of VJ Day. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> if I remember rightly, I was sitting on a number four cylinder of the engine, <laughs> drinking whiskey. <but. laughs> I don't think that was in the sea ration, though, was it? No, no. <laughs> got to find another source for that. Yeah, well, well we had it. Yes. <laughs> the army may march on that also. <laughs> well, not uh, not all that much, but to some degree. Yeah. In fact, actually, <clears throat> this is a little bit of an aside, which I certainly didn't put in my mm -hmm. log there. But shortly after we got to Okinawa, of course, the, the fight was over at that right. point. <clears throat> the damage was not over. Right. The Navy was cut down on, on their, what, presence, shall we say, uh -huh. in there. But <clears throat> somebody poking around got notion that, that <clears throat> the Navy guys knew how to get some booze somewhere. <laughs> so they, they got a B-17, flew it back to Honolulu, loaded it up, Oh, now, really? Everybody, everybody put it, you know, not everybody, but some of us who I didn't know <laughs> threw some money in the pot, <laughs> gave them an order. And how much did they come back with? Pet plane load. Seriously? That's a lot. That's a hell of a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was a whole bunch of people there, couldn't it? Of course. <laughs> you know, That's it got filled it out pretty well. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Well, yes, there are a lot of stories like that that don't end up in the official history books. But I don't know whether you want to put that in there or not. But no, I, I think that that's really exactly the kinds of things that, that people want to know about. And what did what did you guys really do? There were there was a lot of that's a you spent a lot of years and a lot of time, right, um, on ships and in training camps and there was downtime as well as training time. What did you do? What what other kinds of things did you do in your leisure time? Did you play cards? Did you well, I tell did. stories? Did you well, we always tell stars. Mm -hmm. See who's going to be, who can lie the best. About <laughs> what? What do people lie about? Women. Oh, oh. Oh, girl stories. Well, I don't think it'd go over too good in a, in a girl's <laughs> a meeting anywhere, but. No. Yeah, you know, men are men. Well, let's Horror see. Beast. One could say. Um, fish tales, right? Who caught the biggest fish? Only they weren't, your stories weren't about fish exactly. No, but there's, <clears throat> no, so, there was fish caught. <laughs> um, however, coming across the Pacific, mm -hmm. we were right down near the, the equator, about anywhere from five to ten degrees north. Mm -hmm. And you'd wake up in, <clears throat> in the morning and walk around the deck to be flying fish on it. Really? Yeah. And what did you do with them? I don't know. I threw mine overboard. How big were they? Not that many. So did you grew up on the Connecticut coast? 
right where I am right now. All right. So, Beach. so this was you were you were accustomed to be on on the water, but the Pacific's an entirely different. Um, water is water. The Pacific's just bigger. It's just bigger. Um, okay. Um, so, what other things in terms of recreation and leisure time did guys do? After we got out into the <coughs> into the islands. Mm -hmm. Of uh, and we talk and you list the events we finally, I guess actually, when I know the war was over, mm -hmm. but uh, they had that typhoon that roared out through there where a couple of Navy ships popped over right. and all that stuff and then devastated uh, Okinawa basically. And the military uh, encampment that was there. But anyway, we proceeded to, to get out to Ulithi, which was a rather large atoll. And when we got there, there was a... Uh, a big Navy contingent in there, aircraft carriers and the whole business. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what you can put in this puddle in, in the islands. And the islands, you know, I think the average height of the islands above the, well, high water is probably around 60 feet or so. And some of them were not very big, also. The, the, they're very, well, the atoll itself was miles around. <laughs> but the islands that make it up were probably well, a quarter of a mile, half mm. a mile long, some of them. Mm. Not very wide. Mm. But was, you could put a lot of Navy ships in there? Yeah. A heck of a lot of them in there. And were and was that R and R? Were guys on R and R when no, they were in no, there? No, they were just, just waiting for orders. I think mostly to mm -hmm. go home because it wasn't any sense of keeping them all there. But apparently, the engineer corps got the job of fixing up poking out. So we went still, mm -hmm. even though it was over, mm -hmm. which was fine by me. But what kind of stuff did you have to fix up? Lots of contractors' uh, equipment. Um, it was still a pretty, there's a, a lot of work to do there. Yeah, Navy, yes. We had, we had to fix up dredges and this kind of stuff. They were pumping Naha Harbor out um, and building a big airport down the south end of the Mount Island. Mm -hmm. and I, well, we had to keep the machinery running for that. Mm -hmm. And then we, there was a Navy tanker that, Typhoon that sunk right across the entrance to the harbor. And we had to cut that thing in half and float the front end and burn on the back by the other half and how, drop it again. How do you do that? TNG. Really? Mm -hmm. You said uh, and you said it was part we, partly sunk? Mm -hmm. And so you went, how, what, how, did, how did they even set the charges? How did they do the that? The divers. Went, oh, and how much TNG to explode? What was a, a battleship? No, a, a tanker. A tanker, a tanker. Mm -hmm. that, and what did it have inside? Was it carrying material still? Well, it was pretty well empty, I think. Oh, okay, well, that's lucky. That's a big but job. It, I can't even imagine. There's, there's, well, what was inside was very simple. It was water. Right, right. At that way. Right, at that, yeah, right. So, but it extended from, say, the southern side of the harbor, across right across the entrance. Mm -hmm. So we had to chop it off. Mm -hmm and float it around and sink the bow alongside of the stern. Right, that's the kind of work that a salvage ship... Well, that's well, one that this salvage ship did right. anyway. Right. right. And then there was the Typhoon also put, I think, four little small um, island freighters up on the bank, mm -hmm. completely out of water. Mm -hmm. And we got the job of sliding. After the Navy tipped one over and sunk it away, we got the job of taking mm. one other off. And they didn't, they, others they left there right on some start. Mm. So we did that. And then, but the big job was that there was a, a good size freight ship, mm -hmm. Jack freight ship, mm -hmm. sunk in the harbor. Also because of the typhoon? No. No, that was something by 
fire. Okay. And we got the job of the, the, the Navy had gone to work and cut the thing off, mm -hmm. about down to the deck. All the superstructure was gone. And, and we got the job of taking what was on the bottom out. Mm -hmm. And how did you do that? Send divers down. Mm -hmm. Let them wash from one side down underneath the keel, back up, drag a rope, load it down with TNT on it. Inside would go about, try to go about a foot or two foot, either forward or aft of that one that's underneath, and you blow them both together. Uh, and then, and then, what do you do with what what's left? We lifted it up and, and put it on a barge okay. and took it out in the South China Sea in the summer. Oh, okay. So that. You know, you never think about that. What what happens? Other, I mean, obviously, some battleships, of course, and, and other other materials just sink. Period. Oh yeah, yeah. But the the but the military is also in charge of doing some cleanup. And a war that long, there's a lot of cleanup to do. Mm -hmm. There were ten of these ships. Five went to England, to Europe, mm -hmm. and five were, were supposed to go to mm -hmm. to. Pacific. Mm -hmm. And I was working in a shipyard supervising things a little bit and, and inspecting things for the engineer corps. This is the one in the shipyard in Philadelphia? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, it became obvious that number 10 was not going to go. It was only about three quarters completed. Uh -huh. So I talked to my friend and got the job on on number nine, if you will. Because you wanted to go. Yeah. Why? That's my question. I felt I was involved in this whole thing. Mm -hmm. I wanted the experience. And I was happy with the crew I was with. Mm -hmm. If I started, I'm going to finish them. Yeah. And you've known them for a while? Well, I probably was involved with them for, in, in training and this mm -hmm. kind of stuff for a year, pretty near, mm -hmm. in the shipyard. And then it, taking them through uh, trials up and down the coast. We had, we had to pick up yeah. a tugboat right. down in Delaware Bay and, and an oyster boat out of Chesapeake Bay. And so if they were going to go, you wanted to go with them? Yeah. And, uh, and so how long were you together with them, all, to, all, to, all told? Well, <clears throat> until I, well, I stayed, I stayed four months over, over the length of time I had to be there. Mm -hmm. And simply to, because the, the crew had lost the first assistant engineer mm -hmm. and several other people on, mm -hmm. on the ship. The, the skipper and I were very close friends at the, by this time. What was his name? Roy Peel. Okay. And um, I don't know, I love, if I go cruising, it's around here. If I take a boat out, I want to bring it back. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So I stayed with it until, right. you know, it took got to San Francisco. Right. So you started out in Philadelphia, you ultimately you ended in San Francisco, came back to Port in San Francisco. Yeah, left the ship in San right. Francisco. Did you stay friends um, and stay in contact with Roy Peel? Oh, no, for quite a while until he died. When did he die? Too long ago, I can't remember. Too long ago? Well, probably 30 years ago now. Where did he live? After the war, do you remember? <clears throat> yeah. He and his wife lived in Long Island City. Mm -hmm. They got divorced right shortly after he got back. Mm -hmm. um, he got to be skipper out of our engineer corps dredge out of New York. Mm -hmm. really. But that, that <clears throat> and we had telephone contact. The next thing I knew, he was out, <clears throat> he'd taken a dredge, he was running, and he was out 
dredging out to the um, Columbia River Bar at uh, Port mm -hmm. And then he came back. He was out here for a year, I guess. And he came back and he was doing some work up around Bar, not, not Bar Harbor, but Portland, Maine. Mm -hmm. And he met this lady up there, finally married her. She was a very nice person. Mm -hmm. She had two kids, Hellions. <laughs> but, but anyway, next thing I know, he's, he's uh, I, I guess he married her, but I guess I got my two things switched in time. He was in Maine first and then a Portland bar. Mm -hmm. And then he got relieved out there and he told me about it. And, and it was the summertime. So, he, you know, he didn't have any place to live in, that east. So he came in to me for oh, really? some, several months mm -hmm. on the island in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Then he moved over to Saybrook and from thence to Manchester. Oh, so he was never, then he didn't live too far from you? No, he moved from there to Arizona. Oh. And, but I saw him once afterwards, and shortly after that was, yeah. he, he died. Well, they don't, the, from what I understand, the bonds that people make in the service, um, and, and, and if they're together for a long time, those, those don't ever go away. Well, they don't. I still, I still correspond, to call up, go out and see once in a while. My first assistant engineer. Oh, do you? Yeah. Um, what's his name? Lars Larson. <laughs> Where is he from? Tacoma. I I um I grew up in the in Minnesota and I had friends named things like Lars Larson and yeah. Olaf Olafson and oh, yeah. Dan Danielson yeah. and yeah. yeah all the Swedes and Norwegians you got those, it. Are good, those are good names. Uh huh. They are. Yeah, and he yeah. was from Tacoma, Washington. Uh, yes. Yeah. I guess he was actually was kid that yeah. he came from, but he lived the winds up living in Auburn, which is almost a subsidiary of uh, Tacoma. Right. So now you told a story, you have a story in here um, about a, a particular um, night that you were out in the rain uh, and uh, and I'd love you to tell that um, for the interview too. What were you doing and... and um, well, I, was in, I was in the Newers, or on the Newers in uh, Louisiana with the or my ordnance company. Mm -hmm. And we were training to go overseas. Or we were training to be shipped out. Right. I didn't know where we were going. But uh, anyway, I was out running around looking at various jobs that we, we had been doing. You know, fixing this truck and fixing that truck. You know, changing the recoil mm -hmm. business on a three-inch gun, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it was raining, of course, the jeeps at that point had certainly recovered. And there were some side curtains on them, but I don't know, I was running around there. And I came in from that cold and miserable mm -hmm. and walked into the tent that was acting as an ordinance, as an orderly room. <laughs> and my first sergeant looked at me kind of funny. <laughs> he handed me this pamphlet. I said, what the hell is this? <laughs> War Department orders. Well, what am I getting them for? Yeah. Take a look, page so and so. I was down out of the orders department and I was in the engineer corps. Oh. <laughs> I tried play a little politics, I didn't have much luck with that. So, very shortly, I was on my way to Port Delaware, Virginia. Right. But, and you weren't happy about that? No, I wasn't happy about it. I got a fine artist company and I'm there going, I'm going. Right. You know? right. And I have to leave them. Right. You, had, you, you liked the guys and you liked what you were doing. Yeah, but I Other than the rainy, cold Louisiana. Oh yeah, well that's, that's all part of it. But I didn't like the, the first lieutenant that was going to take over. Oh, I see. I couldn't do anything about that by No, no, you you follow your orders, that's what you well, absolutely. Yeah, totally. I tried, but I haven't <laughs> All right, now Mr. Shell said I have to ask you something about beer and barter. 
said that you told him a story about beer and barter. And do you do you remember anything about that? And you can tell for the camera. <laughs> you can't put that in there, did you? Yes, I did. <laughs> yes, I can tell you that. Do, do tell. We were in we were in laying at anchor, just off of uh, the harbor of Nam. And there were also supply ships that were coming into that same anchorage. And they were bringing all kinds of food and, you know, accoutrements for the army. Um, but they also were bringing in beer. And they, these ships couldn't go to a wharf. Mm -hmm. So they would, the quarterback's car was unloading it with, with ducks. You know, oh, those are duck boats. Yeah. They, yeah. Well, they're trucks with right. wheels on them, but they also got a propeller in the back end. Right. Okay. Right. A great invention. <laughs> well, these, these, these things, I guess, have been... Then there was a pretty good fleet up running around here. <laughs> but one of them got into trouble, and the pump he had in there wasn't doing quite good enough. So, he, you know, it was going to be questionable whether he was going to make sure or not. So, you know, my boys are keeping an eye on this whole thing. <laughs> and they had, to, they had to boom the swamp over the side and tackle down real low. <laughs> Come on over. <laughs> so, so the guys did, they were either that or they were going to get wet, you know. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> my boys went to work, got a line on it, took a little strain. Very helpful, your boys. They were being very, very helpful. helpful. Very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> so it came up on the water and everybody got started smiling. She got in there. <laughs> mm. Beer. Well, you know you take it all short, do you? Yes. He's off on that a little bit. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know if that's barter or blackmail. <laughs> What's blackmail, huh, buddy? Black melon, they just want to sing, that's all. <laughs> so we got supplied fairly well because that was that was only just one instance, but this took place probably every couple of days. Because the duck boat would the break down or well, they, no, not always the same one. A, a different one. Oh yeah. <laughs> but nobody nobody um, ever um, um, uh, suspected what was going on. That the choice for the, for the much doesn't matter. Yeah. They either could return. They could either return with almost all their That's load right, or yeah. none of their load because they were going to sink. Right. That's exactly right. So it's Beer a lot, don't float, it's lot better to re return with almost all of it. That's right. <laughs> Very clever <laughs> the men we were with, and it worked it exactly worked. right. Well, you see, we were <laughs> we were rationing. You got, how much was it now? I think it was one can of beer a week. I'm thinking some of your men thought that was. Yeah, well, I think so. Yeah. yeah. It was a little light. It was suggested to them. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's funny. I, I, I heard that it, it is interesting that the Army understands that, that people in the Army need some some alcohol as part of their rations, some, even if it's one can a week. I read a funny thing about Lewis and Clark, that they took just enough whiskey to keep the men in whiskey until they were so far into the wilderness that the men couldn't leave and get back themselves. <laughs> that then they were stuck with them. <laughs> but I you have to keep your men happy. Yeah, well, absolutely. As much as you can under those circumstances, right? Yeah, well, yes. You know, it, it, it's a community you have, really. Right. That's right, um, and uh, um, and everyone is everyone is fighting for the same goal in the end. Oh yeah, because they're not fighting amongst them themselves. Right, hmm. right, right. So, um, and you, you know, the other thing that happened since we we're on this subject. Yeah. <laughs> Good. The other thing that happened is very few soldiers. Mm -hmm thought very highly of fruit salad. Fruit salad? Yeah. <laughs> Did they get a lot of fruit salad? They, well, they got their share. Okay. But they also got, 
and this didn't apply all that much to our outfit because we we were doing pretty good. I'll tell you that story in a minute. But what they did <coughs> in Okinawa <coughs> had a lot of tombs around there. Mm -hmm. These are concrete mm -hmm. stuff just cut into the bank. Mm -hmm. And they're, of course, they're not empty inside, but they're, they're, you, it's, you've got good space in there, shall we right, say. Right, right. Because bodies are just taken and put up on the shelf someplace. Right. Other well, guys go short and take all those things up and put up still in there. One day, okay. they, seriously. Seriously. And what were they, what were they brewing in the still? What were Booze. they using? But what were they using? What did they Food have? Food salad. Corn? They had, no. You got it. No. Yes. What does what does alcohol taste like from fermented you, fruit salad? I have no idea. You never tried it? No, I didn't. I, I, I had some of my own. Oh, you did? <laughs> a little, uh, little southern comfort, amongst other things. <laughs> oh, I'm just trying to imagine fruit salad, some fruit salad. Work. To, yeah, and they knew how to set it up. I didn't have to say it. I don't know. No, these guys did. Oh, yeah. It's good to be with mechanically inclined fellows. I didn't have anything to do with it. But this was what the, the you know, the mud buddies were doing ashore before we got there. Oh, before you? That's pretty yeah. funny. Well, they were doing it after I got there, too, but... That is funny. Now, you said you were going to tell another story, too, about your outfit. You said we were doing pretty well, but I'll tell you that story in a minute. Well, this this ship that I was on was a bit originally being built for the Navy. Mm -hmm. The Army yeah, Corps engineers took it over and they gave it a number. But they also went to work and they gave it a name of a lieutenant that had been killed someplace. Mm -hmm. So one can kind of go get rations. We'd go up to the army place and, and get a load of rations. Boys, <coughs> the boys or some other officer would go to the Navy and get one for the number. Well, what do you know? Somebody else would go and get one for the name. <laughs> so we ate pretty good. I guess so. <laughs> but, you know, we were. I'm telling you, were with some clever guys, I'm telling you. Well, that's, that, that's true. There wasn't any soldiers around who weren't clever when it came to that. Yes. Yeah. They could take care of themselves. That is correct. That is really funny. <clears throat> so you had really twice as many rations. Three times. Well, twice. Right. Yeah. yeah but we got three batches, and the Navy had better than the Army did. And no. <laughs> Why? Just the Navy feels better than the Army does it everywhere. Hmm. That's interesting. There's still a little rivalry between the Navy and the Army. Oh, hell yes. But, one, Navy carries your kitchen around with them, and everybody's there. Oh, true. That's true, so it's a little bit easier. Yeah. yeah. And they've got all sorts of freezers. They can, they can, you know, they can take perishables and keep it for a long time. Hmm. And you stop and think that, you know, the, the modern, um, Aircraft carriers got about six thousand men on it. Right. Oh wow. So you have and to have it. right. You have to have a huge mess. Oh. Yep. Right. So before we started, you and I were talking about the um, dropping of the bomb, and you said um, that, and I told you that many of my students felt that um, they that the um, the fact that the the dropping of the bomb avoided a um, invasion of the home islands. Well, that's absolutely true. Was it? And you were going to tell me how you what you thought about it. Well, I, I would say I thank God for it, frankly. You know, we'd probably be still out there hmm. if they hadn't. I, I got into a roaring discussion with with the uh, Yale professor one day, South Salem. Oh, you were you were sailing together, and you got in. Yeah, he was he was sailing in my boat. Do you remember who the professor was? 
Well, I know very well who he was, but I can't tell you his name right at the moment. All right, well, if you think of it, we'll add it. Well, he's still alive, so I don't know. All right. Oh, it's okay. He probably stands by his convictions, too. Well, basically, the way that it fits. Oh, okay. So, so he was saying, they or she was saying, oh, the that this was the worst thing I've ever read. Well, I, you know, as far as the world's concerned, probably it was. But us, so we were there at the time. Yes. We didn't think it was so bad. Well, there are historians who think that because it was uh, used twice that the, in the Cold War that followed, that's why people understood. That's why nobody hit the button again, because it had been used once, and people saw how bad it was. And so, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, Kennedy and Khrushchev knew that they couldn't do that. They knew what would happen if they did that. That's one one viewpoint that some historians have. But I know that men who were there, especially men who were in the Pacific and men who were training for the invasion, they felt the way you did, thank God. Um, because now I'm, the war is going to end. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to survive. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, I think that's a very strongly felt position. Well, I should be sure the hell out of you. So, yeah, I imagine you had a good discussion that day out on the boat. Um, it didn't come to close, but it came close. I imagine. Um, so. Well, there are some things I don't back down from, that's all. Right. So I promised I would ask you if there was anything else you wanted to tell us about um, that I didn't cover directly in my questions. No, I don't think so. I think we've hashed it out pretty well. Well, I have a big question. One Go ahead. a big question. Like, in your... If you look back on your whole life, what what role did being in the war play in, in the shape of your whole life? Like, did it did it make you feel? Did it shape your opinions about politics or about other military conflicts or about Vietnam or the service or your feeling about our country? What do you? How do you think it changed you as a person? Well, it gave me a profession. Mm -hmm. It gave me pretty good education. It gave me a lot more respect for myself. And what you could do. Yes. And it, and it changed me from a dyslexic, stupid character to somebody with a halfway decent IQ. And but I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think I accomplished a little. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you ended as a, ma a major. That's an that's impressive accomplishment over the course of the time that you were there. You must have learned a lot and added a lot. You provided a lot of leadership to a lot of people. I hope. I'm sure you did. My father died when I was overseas. Mm -hmm. And he was dead set against my going in the first place. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And he had some friends on a draft board and whatever, but his arguments didn't register there. And in retrospect, I'm glad they didn't. But I think one of the reasons that I was so ambitious to, you know, to get some shiny stuff on my shoulders was to make him proud of me. I'm sure it was. It must have been hard to be um, so far away when you died about that. Yeah. I had the other part of this. <clears throat> I had one. person that recognized where I'd gone. Mm -hmm. Who was that? It was a friend of my father's. Oh. But that's all. So, <clears throat> you, it wasn't just you wanted to prove to him that it was good that you had uh, joined um, and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and that he hadn't worked the draft board system. Mm -hmm. to keep you out, but you mm -hmm. wanted to do their, your very best so that he would be proud of you. Yes, absolutely. Still there? That's great.
Thank you so much for telling me that and telling me everything that you told me today. It was really, really great. Matt, is there anything else you want me to add? It's awesome. Thank you very much. Well,